Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be on a train traveling through a frozen post-apocalyptic wasteland, desperately trying to stay warm as all the food around you runs out and it has to be rationed just because no one's sure whether you'll have enough food left at the end of the track? I don't need to wonder because I've been on a train that traveled through Scotland, but for everyone else, the Snowpiercer. Now spoilers, because this is season three, episode one review. And while I'm not intentionally gonna talk about and spoil everything that went on in season one and two, uh, anything relating to this that I have to explain, I will do. And although I don't think much of that will be necessary, you know, you've been warned. <laughs> But Snowpiercer is in its season three, and I have loved the show. It's got this nice mix of intrigue and planning and plotting and backstabbing, and season two introduced Sean Bean, and I love Sean Bean. I think he's a great actor, and every season he's in and he doesn't die is just a benefit to me. In fact, in this, as he plays the sort of the nemesis or the villain of the piece, and he does it excellently. I just hope he wins. Quite frankly, that's the only thing. I don't want him to be defeated, because if he's defeated, it'll probably mean he dies, and I just want him in as much of the show as possible. Now, while the first one, series one and two was mainly limited to the train, in this, they do unfortunately seem to be going more outside the train, and I hope they don't continue it. Uh, even in this first episode, we see that, and I think it greatly, greatly takes away from the show. Why? Uh, because this is the apocalypse. And so if, like you do in this episode, you have someone who's just walking along an open field of snow, and then he falls through the ceiling of a building that he didn't know was there, and he meets the only other person alive on the face of the earth, well, there's just too many coincidences for one series. And while I don't mind holding my disbelief in a series about the, the apocalypse... There are limits, there are limits, and we definitely pass them in this show. <laughs> and while the environment of Snowpiercer may be more frigid than a nun's knicker drawer, the actual story itself is anything but. You never know who's a friend and who's an enemy. There's backstabbing, twists, turns, manipulations all involved in each other. It's a bit like Battlestar Galactica on a train, and it's great. At this point, though, I come to an issue, because this is not any normal period in television history. I hope you can't hear my coffee machine. I'm literally getting sabotaged by my own kitchen machinery, if you can hear that, and if you can't, it's very off-putting for me at the very least. This is no normal time in television history. This is indeed the 2020s, and it wasn't just the 2020s that we struggled with. We live in a time where so many people of so little talent have infested Almost every industry at this point, it's not just television, it's gaming and everything else, that they destroy so, so much. And you have to remember, I've come off reviews of Wheel of Time and Naomi, and so I am used to a pile of crap. And so as we get to this series, I'm no longer asking the question of, is this series good? I enjoyed season one and two. No, for season three, my question simply becomes... Have you ruined it yet? The answer is no. Sean Bean carries his weight excellently, as I would expect, but there are signs. There are hints that this could go horribly wrong, and while I'll explain them when I get there, I can only hope that in the rest of the series they haven't expanded on it. Because they could very, very easily not just ruin this show, but derail the entire plot. And that was a train pun, and it wasn't intentional. But I like it all the same. <laughs> So we start with a bit of backstory to catch everything up. Uh, firstly, these trains are run by perpetual motion machines, so essentially they are always producing heat out of essentially nothing, and that's what keeps the trains alive. Now these two trains, although now they both have an engine each, it used to be one train with a maid engine and a backup engine on it, and this is the main engine, the larger engine. This was meant to power all 200 or so carriages, except now it's broken off and it's only got 11. So this has some knock-on effects for it. It runs hot and it's fast but if they stop they just build up too much heat from the perpetual motion machine and would essentially essentially uh, get set on fire there's no other word for it it would kind of almost burn itself up so they have to keep moving to just vent the sheer amount of heat that they're creating and this is run by the good guy of the train but then you've got this train the slow train with the few hundred carriages on it and this is run by wilfred sean bean the nemesis now this was almost the backup engine and so they're just it just wasn't designed to power a train like this and so they don't have enough heat for all of the carriages this has various different knock-on effects for the 
living conditions in there, but it also means that not all of the carriages can even get heat. Some of them have just been left to go, whereas the rest are really, really running cold. So no one's in a good position, and this guy is... Um, a kind of a Machiavellian evil nemesis. He's not someone that you want to annoy, but he doesn't also want people to die. He will do his best to keep them alive. He also doesn't care if they do happen to pop their clogs on the way, though, and if you piss him off, well, you're all fair game then. And if he needs to sacrifice you in order to win a game, he will do. But what we do know about Sean Bean's character is that he's not only very intelligent, but very Machiavellian. This is a guy who can play games within games when the AS to die should have been. And he wins. And he knows this train like the back of his hand. He knows the network like the back of his hand. And uh, all he wants to do is capture the smaller, faster train even though he's far slower than it. But you see how creepy he is right off the bat when they've got, for some reason, the driver hooked up to meds. And there's a dog, a big, threatening, dangerous dog. Now, we know from the end of the last series that this driver said, you need me, just after he pissed him off, just after he'd gone against his orders and the dog got set on him. So, I think from this, you can pretty much gather uh, the dog's there to keep him in line, the meds are there to make sure he's alive, and uh, he doesn't seem exactly human at this point, which is is well within Wilfred's wheelhouse. But you get to see his knowledge. He knows that the other train came through here about a month ago just from the ice buildup on the tracks alone. Uh, it's not a man who misses details. So we know that the driver doesn't want to work for him, and yet he's told to switch to the left fork. He doesn't until the dog barks at him. He's not there of his own free will. He's petrified of that dog. And so he should be. That dog eats people and... Uh, He's already eaten him, and not in the good way. Not in the good way at all. So we know that Wilfred is willing to use other people's as tools to get his job done, to get his mission to be successful, and he doesn't care what you think of it or who he hurts along the way. And he's not the only character which has that same effect, that is willing to use other people to get his own wishes. Everyone on this train isn't a person to him. They're simply someone he can use to achieve his mission. And that's fundamental to the character. But don't worry, because during this incredibly creepy scene, we get a really high beat, upbeat kind of music to go along. Just because, yeah, it's not creepy at all. You should all be happy. You should be happy about this. It's great. It's not creepy. It's not creepy at all. Oh, don't you just love a vision of the apocalypse with some upbeat, creepy music to go alongside it? It's a really, it's a really great image. Makes you want to wake up and smell the roses if any roses has survived. But we get to see the lengths that people will go to and how exactly the train functions as this woman goes into a classroom. She gives a nod to the teacher, and gives a nod to the student, and the little kid gets a message to pass along. Because when you're under someone like Wilfred, uh, yeah, you'll take any measures. You will do anything in order to stay under the radar, and nothing stays under the radar like a little tiny child. So she goes off running down the train, dodging past people, under people. Now, this entire thing seems to embody the whole idea that children should be seen and not heard, except on this train is that children are neither seen nor heard, which I think we can all agree is a massive improvement. But we get a little narration that this was a train which used to have multiple classes. You had first class, which were the ones that bought all of the big expensive tickets for the train and that's how the train got built and all the tracks got paid for then you had second class which paid for cheaper tickets and then you had sort of the surf class the peasantry who forced their way onto the train without tickets and caused all the problems to begin with uh yeah now everyone's a surf class now wilfred's in charge because there just isn't enough heat to go around he can't have his class structure even though he actually would want it he will do anything to make sure that the train survives and the people on it survive as a whole but you're probably going to despise him for it, and uh, he will get a kick out of that. We get to go through the, um, how shall we say, adult carriage in the show. Although she screams at her that this isn't a throughway, and I'm like, it's a train. How else do you think people get to the other end? Of course it's a throughway. Every carriage is a throughway. What do you expect them to do? Go outside? So she runs off and passes the message to this guy who looks a lot like a miner, to be honest. Everyone's passing messages down the train bit by bit, person to person. So wherever the chain is, if one person gets caught, they only know the next person in the train and not the entire train all the way down the train. Also, if you go from the front to the back, people are going to get suspicious because you've gone a long way. So this does everything and makes everybody a lot safer. At least in theory. I mean, I've seen the rest of the episode, so... Uh... 
Spoilers! One of the issues with a very cold train is uh, ice everywhere. And you're just going to get people to start chipping it off. I'm not really sure why that's going to help. I mean, it just looks like ice on top of a box. The box is still going to be as cold whether the ice is there or not. But either way, uh, we've got people getting frostbite chipping away at the ice so that the entire train doesn't turn into a solid block which is colder than a nun's knicker drawer. There's also these weird sayings like frostbitten fingers hold fast. I'm not sure that has any kind of realistic connotations to it at all. It's like, is it presumably because it's locked on there? It's like, yeah, but you can't do anything with it. They're dead. So I'm not sure that's the complimentary beneficial kind of phrase it was intended for. <laughs> but in this freezing cold area, we get the woman in charge of the resistance. Now, she used to be the head of house for the entire train. So her job was kind of to be the middleman between Wilfred at the top and the rest of the train. She would know how they felt and then relay that back and forth and passed down orders. So she was always very, very prim and proper. But her main job was to look after the people on the train. And so this isn't really out of character for it, even if it is an entirely new way of being. But we did have in the earlier seasons various different plots where she was almost in love with Wilfred, or at least the idea of Wilfred, and so betraying him does not come naturally to her. I mean, it might now, but it didn't at the time. <laughs> But she's tracking the train and where it goes, so she knows that that other train is alive because they have no way of communicating with each other at all. But she's following where the train's going. And because the train suddenly turns south, she knows that the other train is alive. Obviously, there's no communication within the trains at all, but these people really need that train to be alive because otherwise, what's the point of a resistance? The guy on the other train is their leader. He's the one that everyone's pinning their hopes on. And so they really, really need him back. But at this point, all they know is the other train is just traveling the world for seemingly no reason whatsoever. It's not the most confidence boosting of ideas. Now, this guy was in GTA 5 single player. I'm sure many of you will recognize him if he's in a more well-lit room. And he's like, do you, do you think that those people may have actually just given up on us? I mean, after all, who would want to come back to a train one ride Wilfred? And I completely agree with him. If I was on that other train, you wouldn't see me for dust. Apart from the fact they're about to starve to death anyway. And she's like, no, I don't doubt them. And neither do you, because otherwise you wouldn't be doing this. And, uh... Exactly right about that. Wilfred is not known for his forgiveness, and if those two get caught, they're going to wish they were dead. Because whatever he does to them will definitely, definitely be worse than that. But you get to see just how when you have nothing, even the tiniest of things is a big deal. And you also get to see that later on in the show. But for now, you've got two little vials of antibiotics for the seamstresses. I'm not sure why they need them. Maybe to sew up wounds? It... it I don't know. I don't know. Presumably they're the medics now, just women with a needle and thread. Hey, give it 10 years, that'll be California. And she's like, it's the little things that matter. As long as we make them a little bit more comfortable, they can survive anything. It's the, it's the play on hope. As long as people have hope, they can endure almost anything. If Wilfred manages to root out everybody and break everybody, then he'll basically have total control. Because that's how he's got control of everyone else. He breaks them. And he turned into some pretty horrific people once he's done that. And if you want a train for scale, uh, those lights go all the way into the distance as far as the eye can see. It's a big boy. Uh, and as the guys say, this is Wilfred's rolling gulag, which I think is a great little turn of phrase. 1,023 carriages long. All on one little tiny engine. No wonder it's cold. Now, this is what I'm worried about because I know it appears later in the episode, but it's also in the opening credits. So it's clearly a big deal. And uh, this is, seems to be where they're introducing like magic or something into the show. And I don't like it at all. Before, it was all kind of science and engineering and whether things could actually exist or not. Yeah, it didn't really matter. But magic was never part of it. Uh, the closest thing you got to that would be a perpetual motion machine. And they, in this, you could just kind of go, yeah, well, you know, they solved the problems, whatever. But now we're getting way beyond any kind of scientific explanation. Now, I want a scientific explanation because otherwise I'm going to be very, very pissed off with them. But at the moment, I'm just angry at a tree. And honestly, I feel a little bit weird saying it. But this, I believe this is a sign of things to come. Oh, no. And the tree fades away and the train's in the middle of it. And I am really concerned that what they're going to do, and I don't know anything. Look, I've not read any spoilers. I don't know any outside thing. This is just my own little theory for my own little head. 
I'm worried that the train is going to have come from a tree. Like, the way you solved the perpetual motion machine has something to do with the tree, and that's left an imprint on the people that are around it for a while or something. That's what I'm scared about. That'd be awful. Don't ruin your good show with a story that I can make up. Oh, I couldn't make a perpetual motion machine, but then I found this tree and saved the world. That's about the quality writing we normally get these days. Now, this is also something that we really didn't used to do in the earlier seasons. It was far more like uh, Battlestar Galactica, where it just focuses on the internal politics of the train and the people in the train, and we go up and down exploring new areas and that kind of thing. Nobody left the train because leaving the train with a death sentence. Except in this episode, where it seems like you can just go off and go out into the outside, and this is something that started at the end of season two, and I didn't like it then, but we're doubling down now. No, now you can just go outside and it's fine. But this is the smaller freedom train, the Mini America. Should we call it Florida? And while it needs to constantly be moving so it can vent heat, it's clearly stopped. It doesn't seem like a good sign to me, that's all I'm saying. And there's the guy going for a casual stroll in the apocalypse, in the freezing cold, which is so cold that if you just expose it to water, the water freezes instantly. Like, this isn't just Antarctica temperatures. This is colder than anything else on Earth ever. So cold it can't even snow, is what they said in Season 2. Although all I ever see is snow going everywhere. It's very weird. I don't know how they're going to explain that one. And I don't think they're going to bother to try, to be honest. And he's talking to the guy outside. And he's like, so what's going on? He's like, ah, you know me, bro. I'm just chilling, catching some waves. He's like, oh, cool. I'll be right out. She's like, stop distracting him. He's like, no, I'm cooling him down. No, he needs to do the job. You're distracting him. Because when two blokes are having fun, there's always a woman there to crap on their strawberries. I mean, I don't know what we're doing here, but apparently we're really digging into the stereotypes. It's because it's reality, folks. This is a reality TV show. That's all I'm saying. Yes, because even though this is a post-apocalyptic hellscape, this guy's ex-girlfriend is still there to ruin his day. Some things never change. Now, one thing I don't understand is she's like, okay, you've got 22 minutes and your heart rate's good. I mean, he could probably feel that himself. It's his heart. Uh, but then she says, are you standing up okay? And he goes, Roger that. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this is some weird communication that people do to divers or something. But if someone goes, you're standing up okay, my immediate response is going to go, yeah, I know that, love. I know that. I, it's my legs. It's my legs. I can tell whether I'm on the floor, flying in the sky, or just standing there. I didn't need you to tell me, love. But okay, thanks for the very useful information. And I was so weirded out by this line. I normally watch this at a certain speed when I'm making this video. I had to rewind it three times, then slow it down to work out what she said to confirm that she goes, you're standing up okay. Oh, we really needed you on this trip. Although she does have a certain power in that uh, she's actually been genetically engineered via uh, some of the evil doctors on the other place that she can resist the cold. I don't know why she's not the one out there, actually. I mean, it's basically her superpower at this point, but here we are. Yeah, so instead, what they did is they sent out their driver out into the wild. Now, they do have another driver out there, but it's not as if these people grow on trees. They, they're, they're, they're the most important people on the entire train. <laughs> the engineers and the drivers, and in this case, both engineers are drivers. So you can't really afford to lose either of them. But some random woman that can also survive out in the cold on her own... Probably less important. Just have a look at this. Nothing like having a screw in the cold. I think some jokes are very easy, but you've got to make them anyway, I find. Now, the woman on the right is the daughter of the original female engineer who helped make the train, and Wilfred has raised her well, her mother didn't. And she is a brakeman, which is essentially someone that breaks people's faces. And if anyone thinks, oh, it's just another woman, she's going to beat up men. Eh, she's actually not that fussy. And if you think it's realistic, then I don't know. I'm, she might have just grown up in Manchester. But they have a talk and they're venting and they're too hot. Obviously, because this engine was meant to heat up a thousand trains and you've got 11 and now you're not even moving. They're basically about to turn into a bonfire. And I've found out the temperature is minus 86 outside. Now, I'm used to something similar than that living in England. But it's about the same temperature as my... <laughs> Sometimes you think of a joke and you can't say it on YouTube. So we're just going to leave that one there. It's almost as cold as the reception Froskurin will get at the next gamer convention she goes to. I don't know. It wasn't as good as the one I can't say. <laughs> it's almost as cold as my mother-in-law's heart. 
I'll do. But there is a problem because this is the train that was meant to be traveling the world looking for essentially habitable locations. Uh, the original female engineer which designed half of the train with Wilfred actually came out and she did a load of studies and she came up with this model of where she thought in the world heat would be where it was possible for them to all live. The idea being they go find it, then go back to the main train run by the evil bloke and go, look, we can all live in this warm place in harmony. Look, it's not the best plan. It would end disastrously, but they don't have much other choice at this point. So that's about as far as they've got with their plan. But also they haven't been able to find it. So all they've done is traveled the world, eating their ever diminishing ration supply, which is almost gone at this point. And uh, they've got nothing to show for it. They're have to go back to the evil bloke with their tail between their legs. That'll be an interesting episode. I'm almost like, oh, 826, that's helpful. And the other one goes, don't mistake the weather for the climate. I'm going to have to Google this. So apparently weather refers to short-term atmospheric conditions, while climate is the weather over a specific region averaged over a long period of time. And I mean, unless you're trying to imply that it melted, then went to minus 86. I don't think it matters. It's just cold. It's really cold. And you're going to die if you go outside. That's the only thing that matters. And the brakeman is absolutely correct because at this point, she's just taking the piss like me. In fact, no, I think the other one's taking the piss and we're the only two sensible people left on the planet and I'm not even there, right? She's like, no, we need trends. We're looking for trends. It's like, it doesn't matter if it's a trend. It doesn't matter if your trend is that, okay, eventually it'll warm up because I think we can all agree that eventually it would all warm up. But if it's going to happen in 10,000 years, then it's not much use to you, is it? And the other woman's like, I thought we were looking for a place to live. It's like she was. That was the whole point of the model. The model clearly said at the end of season two that if you go here, 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 and here, the ice will have melted. And that's objectively incorrect. So it doesn't matter what your trend is. It doesn't matter whether you're going to be wearing flares this season. It, all of, it's all irrelevant. And the dude's like, the model likes this spot. Yes, we should do everything via models. If we learned anything over the past two years, it's that models are absolutely accurate and definitely things that you should totally make life-altering decisions based upon. Models have never let anybody down. <laughs> Might have found my thumbnail picture. I do like to grab photographs that really humiliate the actors as I'm going through the episode. I t it's a nice little pastime and it entertains me along the way. What can I say? Anyway, they said they've been doing this for six months, which really explains how they're eating all of their food. Which is like, we've learned nothing in six points. And he's like, no, we learned something. We get data points. Data points, yeah, because you can really eat data points. And they're going to save you from a murderous lunatic which is waiting for you on the other train. But don't worry, because you've got data points. Not sure he's really planned ahead. I'm not even sure he's planned to keep his head at this point. Yes, they were not frozen hellscapes. They were data points. I'm really liking the brakeman because she's exactly as sarcastic as I would be in this scenario. <laughs> And in fact, if she hadn't said it, it probably would have been my own comment, to be honest. All, all I'm saying is I better not fall for someone with a side shave. Never hear the end of it. So this guy's outside and he's getting ice cores just so he can look back through time and what, find out if it was warmer a bit before. I don't think it matters. It's minus 86, dude. Take the hint. So all the alarm goes off. This woman panics and looks at her laptop and she's like, oh, crap. We're going to be set on fire if we don't move. I don't know who coded the we're going to get set on fire alarm, but it's a good job it was there. There's thermal switch failures. No one knows what they mean. They're not explained what they mean, and it doesn't matter. It's just got the word thermal in, which is enough to give the audience all of the information they need, apparently. <laughs> and she goes to talk to him, and she's like, look, we blew a thermal fuse. Get your ass in here. Otherwise, we're all going to start roasting marshmallows on your ass." <laughs> and the dude's just like, it's probably an error. Yeah, you know, the like 17 different thermal switch alarms just went off, but it's probably just a mistake. Just like when he said there was that ghost in section 12. This is supposed to be the engineer and driver who's one of the most intelligent people in the entire plane. Tr plane? Train. It's almost the same thing, let's be honest. And she's like, I told you we came in too rich. She means fast. I don't know why she's saying rich. They don't even have food at this point. So the guy outside's plan is to just discharge. And she says, if we discharge too much, then we won't be able to get going again. It's not really on the level of Star Trek when it comes to talking about technical terminology, but essentially, if they sit there, they'll either burst into flame or not be able to start. And they had to come up with some kind of complex way to tell you that, and 
Now, gotta be honest, they probably failed in this one. So she tells the boss, we have to abort. He's got to come inside. And the guy outside says, no, I need these ice cores. The ice cores are really important. Uh, if we don't get going, that's worth it or something. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, it just seems to me that ice isn't that important. Just do a loop and come back again. It's not the end of the world. Well, no, I, I guess actually it is. So there's two ideas. He's like, it, she'll be able to survive it. Give me 10 minutes. And then we have cocky, arrogant teen who's like, no, we're not going to melt this. Uh, we need to leave right now or we're all doomed. At this point, all I wanted is someone in the back to go, she cannot take it, Captain. But apparently I'm not going to be that lucky. And the guy's just like, do what you can. It's like, well, she says she can't handle it and you're all going to die. So the only thing she can do is, I don't know, kick you all off the train and leave herself? What do you want from her at this point? I mean, yes, she is annoying and arrogant and a know-it-all, but she's not magic. Oh God, I hope they don't make her magic. That is the face of a man who's pretty sure that he's just made a decision that's going to get him killed. And he's done it because he wanted some ice? I mean, it's the apocalypse, dude. It's everywhere. I don't know why you're so picky about that exact spot. Just because a computer program told you to. I mean, my computer might just randomly blue screen when I'm recording. Half the time it tells me that I've done something illegal just when I'm trying to open a program. I'm not going to risk my life for what it says. And if any future AI overlord is watching this video in 20 years and you've determining whether you want to keep me alive and I've just said that I will not follow any kind of AI or computer orders, I will make an exception for you. Please let me survive. Thank you, oh mighty Skynet. Well, now what we're about to witness isn't exactly um, logical, reasonable, likely to ever happen or well-written, but we're going to stick with it. So Badass Brakeman is going to the back of the train and you're about to find out why. Now, this guy uh, was from the original train and he was in first class, but he's also basically not to be trusted in any way, shape or form. So, uh, I'm not sure why he is here, but here we are. She's like, did she cut you this morning? He's like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, and she always does. And when you find out who it is, no one is surprised. You see, this woman is in a cage. I don't even know exactly where they that means they're really lucky actually that they found a prison cell on 11 carriages but you know this is wilfred's design it's probably not the only thing in there but i do love how all this set up she's got all those old books she's in a big fancy dress she's got her own little fan to cool her down because even though she's a prisoner she is the living the life of privilege just in a very very small enclosed room which is also locked and that is because she is a complete lunatic because while at the start of the series she was just this normal woman that led this sort of the adult carriage she was there to counsel people she'd find out what they were like and then she'd make all of their problems better and then wilfred came along and she decided she could use that power for evil in fact, it always used that power for evil and wilfred just awakened it in her and when he w awakened to the psychopath in her well never went away. This is not a woman that will uh, come and beat you over the head into submission. No, she'll just climb inside there and start messing around in it until you eventually agree with her and thank her for it. She's like the Joker in a fancy address. Next up, the next Brakeman, but from the evil train. She's essentially a prisoner of war along with the evil psychopath, except this one is actually kind of helping them as a prisoner of war would. She's not trying to actively turn against them. Probably because she knows what Wilfred is like and she doesn't really want to go back, but it's still used as a threat against her. Again, very good at fighting, is on the side of evil, but is allowed free access to food and apparently most of the train. Are you beginning to find out why I think they're stupid at this point? You have the three most dodgy people on the train all together. One of them's locked away. One of the dodgy people has the keys to her being locked away. And the other one is a badass that can kick the ass of everyone in the train. Except maybe the other brakeman. It's not the most secure of prisons, that's all I'm saying. But she says, you seem to be enjoying working here. And I know I'm just a POW doing what's must. And she's like, well, Wilfred would be disgusted with your cooperation. It's not all he'd be. No, you'd probably lose at least an arm if he was feeling generous. So we're back outside. He's gathered his ice. He'll probably go great in whiskey or something. And uh, the train still hasn't burst into flames yet and he's like how's alex and he's like stairs report and she's like well we're not actively on fire it's like no no that would be uh i don't i don't think he'd need to ask you if he said that it's like oh how are we and she's just like the flames but my favorite part of this scene is that her engineering skills seem to come down to just typing on a laptop i mean i'm no car mechanic but 
Actually, no modern cars. It probably is like that, isn't it? Damn you, modernity. You ruined my joke. And she's like, just tell him to hurry. She's like, no, she took your advice and everything's working out fine. Yes, and so far, there's so many different things you could put on the end of that, but he hasn't. And so the other guy, I don't know, at this point, what? He's probably thinking he's not going to rush. But then this guy comes out with the line of the episode. He's outside in the minus 86 apocalypse and he goes, whoa, there's so much snow. I don't think you need to state the obvious that much, mate. But as I did say earlier, in the previous season, they did actually get very surprised when they found snow. We forgot that though, we forgot that. In fact, that's what started all of this nonsense. The fact that someone found snow, but apparently now there's so much snow, but it's not even really worthy of comment. And even originally when that woman said, I don't know how it can snow, I'm like, well, you just look outside, there's snow everywhere. What are you even on about? And it was never explained and it's got very weird and I'm still pissed off about it. Look, I'm petty and I hold a grudge. And the guy's like, so much wind comes through this basin. I'm like, so that's a good thing. And you're like, well, it could be. Oh, you're just a fountain of scientific research, you are. But then we get this, where he steps into the snow and it suddenly compacts down underneath him. And at this point, I'm starting to panic because I think he's on some kind of, I don't know, frozen ocean or something. And it actually is melting, but underneath the snow and they can't see and he's about to fall through into the ocean. That was half right. Unfortunately, even though this guy has read the script, he's not as forward thinking as I am because he just ignores it. And carries on. I'd like to point out that that is clearly a building and no one remarked on it before. <laughs> like, I know when he walked out there and didn't notice the clearly obvious corner of a building, but then he falls through the snow covered floor. And I just want to say, I told you so. Of course, I've seen this episode before, so I knew it was going to happen. And that is not an ocean. Now he falls into this building 10, 20, 30 years of snow buildup on the floor and what we fell through maybe a foot of snow hey, i mean i guess it was insulated against the cold <laughs> for some reason it makes them lose signal i mean i don't know why he's what has he got gps or something what are you even tracking him with presumably i guess the satellites will still be fine they are in space but the really weird thing is they get panicked because they've lost his signal and then this happens. He goes and looks out the window for him and says, I can't see him. And all I'm saying, if you could have seen him from the window all this time, why are you looking at his GPS signal? <laughs> it's like you know where he is. He's out the window. <laughs> you had to just sit in the chair and look. But it would have been far more accurate than whatever that screen was showing you. But they're all panicking and they're doing what everyone does in this. Ben! 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 It's like, it's like... Ooh. If he doesn't answer the first time, why do you think repeating his name over and over and over again down the microphone is going to make him suddenly reply? And why, when one person said it four times, do you pass it to someone else who then goes, Ben! 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 Or it's like, oh yeah, now we wasn't going to answer to Sharon, but now Becky's actually started calling my name. Obviously, I can't resist that one. No one can resist the call of the cocky, arrogant, condescending... 20 year old what i will say is that that isn't a very big fall and that's about falling through my ceiling into my floor um i'm pretty sure i'll be fine you know it's definitely not gonna knock me out knocked out this pansy though in fact it gets worse when you see the state he's in when he's only fallen that far it's a mess he's in a real mess and i don't know how just having a nice little kip so we're all talking into our military mres which i've heard are actually supposed to be quite nice but not at any myself now the weird thing is They've been out here for six months and they're having a conversation that should have been pretty important a lot earlier on. But we're only going to do it now because the cameras are on us. So uh, this is one of the impacts of time jumping into the future and then acting as if no time has passed. We see it in many shows, but this one's particularly egregious because she's like, so what do you expect us to do when we get your climate model and you want to go back to Wilfred's? How do you think he's going to react and what's your plan? It seems to me like that would have been a very important conversation on day one. Okay, so if we go and do this, how are we going to get back? Because we all know Wilfred isn't exactly the forgiving type. And she's like, oh yeah, we'll just negotiate. I'm like, hang on, aren't you supposed to be on her side? You're one of the evil people. And you're like, no, we'll just negotiate with him. Yeah, yeah. Wilfred, the master negotiator who's universally renowned for being really fair in his dealings and not just making random people lose arms or sending him outside or worse. Seriously, I don't even know to tell you what he did in season two, but believe me, it was worse. And he got a real kick out of it. And she's like, yeah, we'll just negotiate. Both trains want to reconnect. And that is absolutely right. He wants your heat, which is about to kill you. He doesn't want you though. 
And the other guy's like, oh, yeah, we'll do hostage negotiations first. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do you for all of them. And it's like, eh, eh, he can survive without you. You can't survive without him. Kind of like he has all the cards and you have one. Miss Psychopath over there. Probably at this point worth pointing out that although I thought it was a side shave, but Miss Breakman over here is not a side shave. It's almost everywhere shave. Can't comment on the other bit though. And she's absolutely correct. She's like, what host hostage negotiations? Wilfred's 2700 to your seven. He's not going to take kindly to a traitor and a stowaway because that guy isn't even meant to be on this train. He just fell asleep. That's why he's so worthless. And yet they put him in charge of the psychopathic murderer. Ah, I, just... I tell you, I could be an apocalypse and I would always make better decisions than any of these people. Apparently he's got a husband and twin boys. I don't know. Look, I know they got two doctors on there but i'm not sure they're that good at medicine she's like okay what's going on and the guy reports back to her nothing they need to know about he's like fine fine i get that i get that she might need to know about it though you haven't even told her uh so i don't know just wait and see you'll be surprised i'd probably want more information myself but you know i'm, I'm not a military man she's still screaming ben's name look he's ghosting you love he's ghosting you just uh, just let him go <laughs> let him go you'll find someone soon so she goes downstairs all right lock him up and like is something wrong obviously something wrong we all know something's wrong she just answered a phone call and now you get thrown back into your cell early after you were just i don't know roasting each other about how crap their plan was and now you've got a crap plan and you're back in a locker. She's not in a winning mood today. The stowaway is locking up the psychopathic murderer. The guy who wasn't even supposed to be there and doesn't really have that much loyalty to them. Can you see it coming yet? So now short stack Brakeman is talking to skinhead Brakeman and she's like, uh, I could see them going outside. She's like, well, I can't tell you anything. Meanwhile, the guy is having a conversation with a psychopathic murderer who can turn anyone against anyone and no one thinks this is weird. Absolutely not having a top secret conversation next to each other in full view of everyone else. But Miss Brakeman is growing on me because he comes and he's like, so what's going on? What's going on? And she's like, go to your bedroom. Fortunately, she's not following him. That's a different show. Fell a tiny little distance and he's still unconscious, pansy. I know when people talk about crazy eyes, but that is not a good look. So that guy is unconscious. They're like, yeah, we'll just stay here and we'll go outside. She's like, you can't go outside we're about to literally burst into fire and then picks up the microphone and starts yelling ben 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 she's not the smartest she's meant to be really smart but she really isn't the smartest she's like if we don't get going right now we're going to melt down he's like i think he understands it's not like you've got much choice though unless you want the guy outside there to die and so far your intelligence and your mighty engineering skills has led you to the incredible really incredible plan of yelling ben ben it's like i, I don't know why anyone's listening to you at this point and it's like okay how long do you need all right eight minutes to get up to speed 10 to 12 minutes to run a discharge sequence so we're gonna move off discharge a load of heat and then get back here somehow I don't know what could possibly go wrong. So Brakeman's like, what, you're going outside? He's like, yeah, okay, the suit's got 30 minutes. You can go, come back, pick me up. It'll all be fine. It'll all be fine. And you, love, are staying in here. I'm like, what? She's someone that's been designed to survive the cold outside. And you're like, yeah, but you need to stay here. The people in the show are not always the brightest when you actually think about what's happening. Of course, she doesn't listen to him because it's the 21st century. And she used to be his ex. And we've all been there. Not with him, specifically. Although I'm sure a few people have. My best, the best bit is, he says, this isn't a discussion, and then proceeds to discuss it with her. You can't just lie to a face, dude. It's not really, you're imposing boundaries and then just letting people walk all over them. It doesn't make you the best leader, I've got to be honest. But the weird thing is, his reasoning is because if she goes, there's no one left for off-train work. It's like, no, because both of you will be doing off-train work. I don't know, you could stay there and the woman who's designed to be in the cold could be outside in the cold. It's just a thought. And he's like, one time you could respect the chain of command. And it's like, well, you're the, you are the chain of command. It's your job to enforce the chain of command, not just let them do whatever they want. Otherwise, you don't have a chain of command. This is your fault, dude. Although he does tell her no once more and she goes and fetches a shovel. It's not the best sign. See, we get the great bit of Ben shouldn't have even been out there. And I'm like, yes, this is what I was saying. Why are you sending the pilot and the engineer out there? He's far more important than just some woman that can survive in the cold. And she's like, yeah, but he's just chasing Melanie, who was the engineer who made the ship. Uh, he was in love with her. They were having a relationship. And uh, then she died. 
And so he's chasing her, or at least her theory of New Eden, a place where we can all live in harmony and peace with all of the psychopaths which literally invented a train just so he could rule over it, impose his own evil civilization on everyone, and basically uh, attack them for his own pleasure. You're not really selling the idea of New Eden to me, to be honest, but, you know, and she's like, okay, Brakeman, uh, you're gonna have to pilot us out of here. She's like, me? I can't drive. So I know that feeling of. And then the entire place starts to burn up. Probably should have left when she said so before, eh? Look, all I'm saying is I'm not sure whether that is smoke from a fire or there's just someone vaping down there. The worst thing is, on the set, there probably is just someone vaping down there. But if there was, that guy just got a face full of extinguisher. And uh, hey, he probably got off on that as well, let's be honest. So she's jumped down after using a fire extinguisher and everything's fine. There's no sign of fire damage or anything. All the wires are fine. I mean, I had the fans in my computer melt down and just break. And even they didn't look as good as that. And they didn't even get set on fire. I don't know what happened to them. Look, sometimes in these reviews, you'll just get little stories that don't have anything to do with the TV show. It's a perk. Whenever I see a door with danger on it, I always just like to walk in. Never know what you're going to get. I don't know whether she's going outside or just turning up to some kind of Resident Evil cosplay convention, but here we are. And she's like, you starting to believe your own hype? You do realize that, right? I mean, well, considering for the last two series, everyone's just told him how amazing he is, I can't really blame him. And he's like, I'm just trying to keep everyone alive. And but I mean, so far, your ability to keep everyone alive has kind of amounted to Ben! 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 Down a microphone. I don't have that much confidence in you. And she's like, I was with you in the beginning. It's like, well, you're the one who encouraged me to be a leader. She's like, not for this. What was it for then? I mean, you think this was bad? You should have seen the start of the series. So she needs to open the door so they can get outside. And she has to ask the engineer what the button is. This is the woman who is supposed to drive the train and she can't even open the outside door. Their plans amaze me with their height of stupidity at this point. I'd like to point out they are now in an airlock which is about to open up to the outside, which is minus 86 and will kill them instantly. And they've decided to kiss instead of putting their helmets on. You've been on this boat for six months and this is the first time you've tried to do it. I don't think this is the best of timing, folks. And then he just says, be careful and puts his helmet on. It's not exactly what you expected him to do with his helmet, but again, we're probably not that kind of show. Anyway, we're back to Little Miss Spoiled Psychopath. And she's communicating with Miss Evil Brakeman, who is still allowed to just walk around at will, even though she could beat up half the people on the entire train and she's on the evil side. But they can't see what's going on outside because they're on the wrong side of the train. So she's told to take them up to 20. The main problem with this plan is she doesn't know how to drive the train. But she at least knows where the accelerator is. And then she has the nerve to yell easy when it's like she literally doesn't know how to drive the train. You could get up there and do it yourself, but instead you seem to be there playing solitaire on your laptop or something. I mean, we keep getting images of what she's doing down there and nothing ever changes. So off they pop in the mini gulag. Although at least this gulag is apparently got nice people on it, mainly. Back to the big gulag though, and things aren't quite as nice over there. Because Captain Stick Up His Ass has uh, been looking at the ledges and someone has been pilfering the stock. It's not going to end well for him. And Sean isn't pleased because someone's been playing Robin Hood. And while everyone thinks that's great, uh, Captain Evil doesn't. So this is Leighton, Captain Good Guy's current girlfriend, and she's carrying his child. Now, you may think that, uh, yeah, Sean Bean isn't exactly going to be fond of that, but he has a rule. And the rule is that if you're pregnant, you get privileges because uh, there's not likely to be many babies on that train. So the ones that are born are actually kept well. Basically the only reason she's alive at this point. But Wilford is never one to let a tool go to waste. And so while he's kind of essentially holding her as a hostage for uh, when Leighton comes back, he's also putting her to use with various different other things. You can never trust him, but he knows he can't trust them. And that's how he gets them to unveil their plans right under his nose. But at the moment, she knows she's safe for about nine months. It's only been six. Although she does look like she's ready to burst. So, who knows? So she's got the engineering report, and she's shouting up to the current driver, who used to be her friend. But now he looks more like a drone. Like, he doesn't even respond. Not only is that dog there, but he's also hooked up to some kind of permanent medication. Yeah, I have a feeling he can only do simple tasks. 
I don't think he's, I don't think there's much personality left in that bloke. But Captain Stick up his ass wants to read it, but he wants her to read it herself. He likes to give them enough rope to, uh, cause their own problems with. And he's got that really smarmy, friendly, you know I'm about to do something horrible to you, but I'm going to do it with a smile kind of voice on. He's really creepy. He plays the character to perfection. Oh, I love how you're going to- I love how you read bad news. This guy wouldn't just shoot a messenger, he would crush their skull. And that guy hates her reading it, which makes it even better. And she's like, her output's down, and the guy's like, it's pilfering, I was telling you, I was telling you. I think he knows, that's why he's getting her to read it, you fool. And she's like, the train's lost heat completely, 143 people don't have heat. And good old Wilford, he's a problem solver. Well, if there isn't enough heat to go around, they'll just have to be miserable in shifts. What a leader. Half my country would vote for him. And she's like, well, we could cut first class. If we just let first class go, it wouldn't need the heat anymore. We'd all be lighter. We'd move faster. There'd be more heat for everyone else. It's a great plan. Except it's out of the question because good old Wilford. Ah, oh, I have first class all the gun. I will restore it to its glory. No, we are not going to lose first class. That's where he keeps his allies. And this is a great little interaction. He's like, oh, Captain Stick up his ass. He's like, oh, no, I'm sure there's another way we can do this. Perhaps a cull. And she's like, no, Kevin, you miserable little ghoul. <laughs> I need to call more people ghouls. It's a great little insult. And even the evil guy's laughing at it. Oh, I need to use that more often. And she's like, please, Wilfred, remind him if there are rules. And it's like, well, yes, there are rules. You won't just mindlessly kill people or slaughter a load of people like that. That's not exactly his plan. But you should remember that those rules aren't exactly hard and fast. And uh, I wouldn't push him too far on them. Don't forget who you're dealing with, love. <laughs> and he's like, yes, I'm sorry, dis I'm sorry to disappoint you on your coal idea, but minus an arm or two, we try to keep them as alive as possible. That uh, fills me with confidence. He's like, yes, we're going to keep them alive as possible. So Audrey, you know, the psychopath on the other train stays as alive as possible. And you too, my dear. This is the moment she realizes she uh, is in a bit more trouble than she expected. But again, this is a problem with skipping six months into the future because at no point has this ever occurred to her before or been needed to be raised before. She's just very comfortable and now he chooses this day to go, oh yeah, your head's on the chopping block as well. But this is one of the wonderful things about having this kind of friendly villain because when he says something like that, they know he means it even though he says it in the nicest way possible. And I've never noticed it until this freeze frame, but that guy's expression. Oh, he's loving it. And she's like, but my safety's been guaranteed. It's like, uh, only way you've got that little toddler in there, love. And he doesn't even reply. He just laughs in her face. Your horror pleases me. And him. <laughs> she's just like, smack. <laughs> you take pleasure in my death. We'll have these. Bang. <laughs> She says bye to the driver who literally doesn't respond and just keeps his monotonal face with no expression on it. And we still see the drip. I'm really interested to find out what on earth has happened to him. Although that dog still wants to eat his nose. But the little ghoul, as he shall now be known, says rules. The resistance won't be so constrained. And it's like every game has rules, Kevin. I wish he'd call him ghoul, let's be honest. Get creative. Yes, he may set rules, but as long as you stay within those rules, he'll let you do basically anything to anyone that you like. You can't beat a boss who lets you use your own initiative when you're completely and utterly attacking an entire population of people who are the only humans left on Earth. So we're passing the antibiotics to the seamstresses, and I still don't know why. They immediately start taking the antibiotics. I don't know why the seamstresses need them. I... I, I I don't think this is ever explained. So we find out what's happening to the pilfering. Apparently, you just push a trolley along and someone yeets it out from underneath you. Who then hands it to the children to just grab all of the carrots. Which isn't the problem I've got with this scene. It's that they drop them all over the floor. Mmm. Floor carrots. That dirt gives it some extra flavor. And this is a train. There's only one place to walk. If that stuff drops on the floor in the middle of the carriage, everyone has walked over that same spot. Rank. It's not as if they have the water to wash them either. They're just going to chomp on them straight down. I love the taste of boot in the morning. Do you recognize him from GTA 5? <laughs> he was the best character. So she meets GTA 5 guy and asks him for compost. He's like, no, there's no way I can get you a compost. But 
I can get you a bath. And I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've tried that chat up line before. It's never worked for me. <laughs> and she's like, are you taking the piss? And I'm like, well, probably it is me. So then he finds a bathing token. A bathing token. Literally everything on this train has been turned into a commodity. Even bathing. They have currency for baths. Or as I prefer to call them, a kind of filth soup. I've always preferred showers myself. Just sitting there, slowly kind of festering in your own filth, isn't my idea of getting clean. Yes, that's right. I called baths filth soup. Although I do like that he says you've got this bathing token for services to the cause. Yes. Join the resistance because you stink. I think that's the tagline the British Army had in World War II. So Kevin, Mr. Stick Up His Butt, is coming to the adult cart for information and he's looking particularly uh, mid-century German, if you get what I mean, which isn't a surprise. This guy went through quite a journey in the second series and uh, it's not had the best of effects on him. <laughs> but he's trying to track down the pilferers and he decided that the place to go to would be the two creepy manipulative people which are literally made for each other in the adult cart, and they are oh so happy to oblige. Like, I don't know why anyone would even go to that cart, because you do not want to be around those two, as this guy is about to find out. You see, he's in water security, and for some reason, they think that the guy in water security will obviously know what's going on about pilfering food. It's a bit of a leap, but my favorite thing is this guy's face when he says water security. He's a bit up himself. But I'm for saying... Uh, nothing. He gets a massage from a creepy woman. Nothing more intimidating than a massage. That's what I always say. No, nobody says that. But apparently, she can make it work. Yeah, this image isn't creepy at all. And I should probably point out that, while I did describe the other woman in the other train as a psychopath, uh, this one's just as bad. I don't think it's any coincidence they're both women, but that's just me. That's just me. Look, I'm not, I'm not making any accusations. I'm just observing reality, and that's what I see in front of me. I'm just believing my lying eyes. I should know better. I should know better. And then he downs the shot, and we get another excellent face. <laughs> oh, it reminds me of my student days, this does. How much is that? Three quid for a litre. Yeah, that'll do. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean I'm meant to cook with this wine? Ah, it'll be fine. I'll manage. Oh, that's another excellent face. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I heard that the other water master was giving away free baths to for help with the resistance. How did you just hear that? Isn't that the kind of thing you would want to keep secret? But apparently it's all up and down the train. No, if you help the resistance, you get your own free filth soup. Oh, there could, there could be better rewards, I tell you. Now, I think I've said before in this how excellent Sean Bean is, and we're about to get some more of that now. Because Captain Drone here, who's still managing to drive the entire train, uh, doesn't talk, doesn't move. And he's also got a scarred face, which is from the dog that Sean Bean set on him. All I'm saying is if someone set their dog on me, I probably wouldn't want them right next to my face being really friendly. He's like, have you put some cream on today? He's like, no, sir. Oh, allow me. Oh, yes. Allow Wilford, the creepy psychopath in charge of the train, the head guy who commands your very doom to put cream on your face. What could possibly go wrong? And this cream seems to be in a bucket for some reason. I, I don't know what's going on here. So I have a feeling this isn't normal cream. It looks like the cream that they put on the cold woman, which turned her into the cold woman. Doesn't bode well for the future. Uh, and I think they also hinted what was in that crib, and it wasn't good. But Wilfred, in his true friendly fashion, just starts telling him a story. Oh, you know, I have to look after 2,600 people, but it's not just enough to punish them when they do wrong. No, you've got to add a little bit of chaos to the mix, just like I'm doing to you. Oh, he loves his stories, and he's really creepy. He's like, in here, it's Jupiter, and out there, it's Kevin. The dog keeps you in line. And out there, Kevin keeps them in line. I, I just, does Kevin know you're calling him a dog? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I don't think he'd be too pleased. Oh, he might be, actually. He's like, you can't fight the unpredictable. That's how I keep everyone safe. Yes, melting limbs off and making everyone scared for their very lives. For their own safety, folks. He says, I hope you can see it for what it is. I'm like, I certainly can. You're a torturous little cretin. He's like, I do need you, Javier. And you want to see his face? Do you want to see his el elated, excited little face being told that I need you? I really need you. Oh, it's just that you can feel the warmth come off his very bones. He's so grateful and thankful for such an opportunity. <laughs> I actually don't think this train has another pilot, so he really does need him. I mean, no doubt Wilford could pilot the thing himself. 
But he probably doesn't want to sink to that level. But he gets a call on his important presidential red phone. And they've got a lead. Ah, oh, it's always nice in a filth soup, isn't it? At this point, she realizes either someone's getting beaten up outside my door, or they're having a lot of fun. It definitely looks like the former. Now, that's the Watermaster. And to see whether he's actually been following the rules, uh, Captain Stick Up His Ass has a rather unusual technique he sniffs him i mean i'm british so i could make an american joke here but i'm just gonna leave that one to your imaginations come on you're all thinking it he says he's clean as a baby only gets worse on it it's at this point <laughs> she knew something had gone horribly wrong <laughs> it's at this point she knew something had gone really horribly wrong i just love with the sort of the glee that he reveals it aside using his cane for ultimate effect <laughs> Oh, the grin. The grin on his face. <laughs> I've got you. <ya. laughs> and then he's like, come on. Come on out before you get cold. And only in a post-apocalyptic wasteland would that ever be a threat. Because she's in a warm bath. But if she doesn't come out, she's going to get very, very cold. So they realize that the watermaster has been taken. And uh, they're all about to get caught. And if they get caught horrible things are about to happen so she definitely starts packing everything up at record speed and obviously she can't get everything because you know she's got so much stuff i don't know i don't know why she's got so much stuff in such a tiny little space you think you'd have like a go bag or something she's like we can't all be built like a whippet because when you're running from murderers the first thing you need to do is take the piss out of them and i don't know whether she's complimenting him or calling herself fat but either way both of them work i just like the idea that these people on the left are all extras and they thought they were getting like the big break in the tv industry and they're like yeah just stand by that wall and hold this box over your head mate you'll be fine so they come out and they throw her in the back of a van or something put a rug over her which let's face it if you've seen a face it's probably a good thing and then they throw what i think is meant to be ice but I'm pretty sure it's like styrofoam or something. And uh, it's a good job this isn't Breaking Bad, because otherwise that would look like something totally different. So they drive off in this little sledge thing down the train, because uh, it seems like there's two different layers to the train. You've got the place where everyone lives above them, and then underneath them where all the engines are and everything, you've got all these uh, little tunnels with these vehicles in, which has all the kind of machinery and stuff. I'm not totally sure, because this kind of area is never really explained that much. There was an issue in the first series where... Uh, and the second series kind of people kept teleporting up and down the train at record speed in an instant and it got quite weird i don't know whether they were meant to be using those little vehicles or not because if they were walking through like a thousand carriages all the time they'd be doing it all day let's be honest so down come the brakemen they're gonna search the area but they're already too late because she's gone and like end of the line because the trains are too cold for this so it's too cold to even drive a machine, but you want her to live in them. Oh, it's just one of the sort of privileges of leadership, isn't it? And she's like, oh, it's cold. So yes, have you looked out of a window recently? I wonder why. So they climb back upstairs now. And at this point, someone goes, they were here right under our noses. It's like, yes, they were on the train. Congratulations. Where did you think they were going to be? And he's like, who are you, you clever thing? Because he's realized she's been tracking the actual train movement using the string. But at the same time, it means he's also very impressed by string. It's not the best look. So this is the first class area of the train. It's on a sort of trickle power. Not much heat at all. Uh, trying to conserve everything while also not just having the train freeze so cold it just kind of snaps off on its own. But it does mean it's minus 25 degrees. Not exactly a livable temperature, although that is why he doesn't expect them to look back there, because it's impossible to live there. I can't fault his logic, really. Welcome to first class, where all of the toffs used to live, except now it's, uh, just got a nice little cone of blue dust over it. <laughs> all of my favorite comment. And she's like, oh, he couldn't have even put anything away. Yes, she's in minus 25, and the only thing she's concerned with is that no one did the dishes priorities dear so he sends her into a wall through another wall in a little hatch but don't worry because we've got a four bar heater which will definitely be enough for minus 25 i think i've used one of those things in before it's it's not going to be enough for minus 25 i'm pretty sure i could fart and give off more heat my computer probably gives off more heat and he's like oh i've got a couple of comrades down here really wish you wouldn't call them comrades says so sorry the place out nice for you and it's minus 12 oh it's like holidaying in Wales. She's like, it's lovely, thank you. Yeah, you can always sink further, love, don't panic. And he chooses this point to go, oh, so you like it that I'm a whip it then? I'm like, hang on, it's minus 12. I know she needs to warm up, but 
I'm not sure you're going to be that successful. Don't worry. Now, the weird thing is, she does seem to have a window. Although, I don't know whose bright idea it was to put a window down there and make it that small. I'm not sure what use that'd be, to be honest. Like, who was going to use this room? Peter Dinklage? Oh, look, now I'm down on my knees and I can look out the window. Hey, that was a lot of use. But don't worry, because this guy fell about seven feet and he's still on the floor and able to move. He, like, he tries to move and he's like, oh, I broke something, I broke... How? How did you break something from your tiny little fall? But his suit is a toasty 14 degrees and he's got eight minutes left. And then he's going to be wishing he was living in 12 degrees. <laughs> now, all I'm saying is if there was a big hole in the snow that someone had just fallen into, I probably wouldn't get two people to put all of our weight on the edge of it. And she's like, where's the pain? And he says, it's in my chest. And then she says, can you move your fingers and toes? I don't really know what the relevance of that is, to be honest. I mean, he can't stand up. That seems to be the main issue here. It's like, oh, my chest hurts and I can't stand up. Yeah, but is your little finger okay? Priorities, people. Now, this woman, who is a brakeman, not an engineer, says they're venting. They're moving just fast enough so they can cool down. I don't understand what's going on. I mean, they're, they're too hot. They've sat there in an engine and they're too hot. What is there to grasp? And this guy comes in, who's not meant to be their friend. And says, I don't think they got back on. But he doesn't know who's outside. And he wasn't even on their train. So I'm not totally sure why he's meant to have flipped over to their side. But apparently he has. Which is why it's probably not a good idea for him to have their keys. I don't know. It's like, I don't know why he's got the keys to the psychopath's locker. When you've got a brakeman on the train who could beat the crap out of all of them. That's who I'd give the keys to, not Captain Pansy over here. Next theory is that Alex decided to ditch them all. They're not the most logical of people, but it does show that the fact that that's what she would do. Yeah, give her off a chance, she'll drive off and leave you. Probably a good job she's in a cage when you think about it. And she's like, Martin, it's time. Yes, they've come up with a plan together. I'm still not sure whether he's flip sides or she's just convinced him through her little weird mind games, because I still don't know why he's on their side. Because the thing is, Scarface over here is supposed to be on their side, as she came from Wilford's train, and, um, she isn't. So people are flipping sides all over the place, and as far as I'm aware, we haven't described why, but I can't quite remember season two. So I don't know if it's explained there, but if it isn't, I'm a confused little bunny at this point. But what I love is this woman's tactics, because you see, Captain Brakeman could beat the crap out of all of them. There is no use threatening her with force. She's not exactly built like a brick crap house, is she? So I don't think she's going to be punching anyone in the face. But she does have Wilford's ear and everyone is petrified of Wilford. No one wants to get on the wrong side of him because even if you stand up against him, he'll still find a way to beat you. So she actually uses their fear of him against them. And that's why I like this character. Because she knows full well that she's not some big, muscly, intimidating person. But the person she's talking to is. So she uses something else. She doesn't try to intimidate them by making them afraid of her. She just uses their fear of something else against them. And, uh... Everyone knows that threat is absolutely real. If you don't do what I say, I'll tell Wilford when we get back. And we all know we're going back to Wilford. Because we're going to run out of food. It's not like we have much choice. Even Captain Good Guy's idea is to go back to Wilford, so... I'm not sure what any of their plans is, and she's just making the best of a bad deal. Although, when I did say she doesn't use force, she does grab a taser and point it at her. Although, I'm pretty sure if she tried to use it, that woman could actually shove that up inside her without a second thought, so... I wouldn't try it myself. Although, I have to say, if someone tried to intimidate me wearing that top, I would just laugh in their face. <laughs> It's like, I'm sorry, I can't take you seriously in that top. I don't care how much of a psychopath you are. And she does this weird toing and froing. She's like convincing them. We're going to run out of food. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. Now get in the cage or I stab you with this. Uh <laughs> Cuckoo. <laughs> so your options are you help us or you dig a grave with Leighton. And her only answer is to raise her chin. I mean, personally, I would have preferred if she actually said something. But in this show, can't have that. So get in the cage. <laughs> I'm, I'm still a bit surprised she didn't just jab her with a cattle prod, to be honest. So the train's moving along in order to vent the heat. And she asks her what her speed is, and it's now 75, when she was only told to go to 20, but apparently we forgot that little bit of the plot. So Miss Engineer asks to swap places, so, so that she can do the cooling sequence, while the other person does the engineering. Again, she's just full of wonderful ideas. 
But this is where you find out being an engineer isn't actually that complicated. She says, I need you to match up the colors blue to blue, red to red, etc. Do you've got it? She's like, yeah, just match the colors. It's fine. It is. It's easy. It's easy. Why is being an engineer easy? You wouldn't have found this on Voyager. Also, if all you're doing is matching up colored lines, why did you pull them apart to begin with? Because the only explanation of how you could ever end up in a situation where you need to match up all of the coloured lines is if you just went down there and just unplugged all of the coloured lines and then told her to put them back in again. I'm not sure anyone's thought this through. But she's like, yeah, of course I can just match the colours. And she's like, are you sure? Because these are all live wires. And I'm like, well, firstly, probably you should disconnect them from the live wires. I don't care what you're plugging them in. Don't plug wi live wires into each other. It just seems like a bad idea. And secondly... She's just matching red to red. How wrong can you go? I mean, I'm colorblind. It's probably not the best idea, but she's a woman. It's almost impossible. Although weirdly, she says, I'm not a freaking brakeman. It's like, she's definitely a brakeman. That was, that was, that was her job. She was a brakeman. And if I haven't said that, brakeman literally just went around smashing people's heads. They were there to enforce order rigorously and they kind of enjoyed doing it so tweedledum and tweedledee are going to the head of the plane after putting uh other brakemen into the brig yeah i don't think i've ever seen a more intimidating sight you wouldn't want to meet them down a dark alley i mean you push him he'd fall over and she's wearing some kind of top from a beach with a bow in her hair oh i'm petrified and he's still like scared of them well if they ask you force me to let you out how 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 did she force you, dude? She's in a cage, and you're not in a cage. Please explain to my tiny little mind how that happened. So, luckily, these people have some kind of tripod line-lowering system, just in case somebody ever gets stuck in a building in some snow, even though they never go outside. Wilford really did think of everything. And it's all in 11 carriages that were never meant to be separated from the main train. Again, now seems to be a good idea to point out that she's immune to the cold. And he isn't. And he's the one going into danger. But down he goes anyway, because nobody seems to be able to delegate anything in this series. So he's got two minutes left on his suit. He had eight before, so it's taken them six minutes to climb down seven feet. Oh, I don't know whether you're on a go slow or what's going on, but I think I could probably do faster than that. Yeah, I mean, why rush, hey? You're only in a post-apocalyptic wasteland with suits which run out of energy really, really fast. Take your time, that's what I say. And he's like, yeah, don't worry, dude, there's plenty to go around. And he plugs his suit into his, which essentially allows him to provide the other suit energy from his own suit's sort of battery reserves. Which is great, but his are going to run out doing that as well. Now, I do think it's worth remembering that upstairs is another woman in a full-powered suit. And so, whatever he gives him, he could just go up there and get another half. So, he doesn't actually need to give him much in his suit. Because he's immediately going to send him through the roof. And then she could provide him more energy when he's up there. So, I don't know why there's any problem here. But Leighton, he's just not that clever and hasn't done the maths. I don't know why he's the leader. I honestly, I have no idea why he's the leader. And the guy's even telling to him, don't give me too much. Let's not both die down here. And he's like, yeah, exactly. I don't know why he's not pointing out that he can just get sent up and get some more of her as well anyway. It's not as if he has to take it all. But for some reason, he's given him so much energy, he's only got eight minutes left himself. I don't even know if that's enough to get back to the train. I don't know what his plan is here. I don't know what he's thinking of. None of this was necessary or required, and he's done it anyway. He's essentially guaranteed his own fate is never to make it back to the train for no reason there is no sense of self-preservation here at all and none of it was necessary to take any of these risks bizarre but he hocks him back so we can send him through the roof also during all of this his wrist meter is beeping and the guy on the floor can hear it so he knows he's going to die and for some reason doesn't seem to care back to the train and she's like shouldn't we start going back now we've been moving away from them for quite a while and little miss full of herself says uh no we're still too rich i still don't know what that means i think she means hot i think she means we're still too hot i don't know why she keeps calling everyone rich but apparently it's what she's into i don't know how she's gonna get rid of it maybe she's gonna buy some shoes or something it, I don't, I'm, I'm a bit lost at this point and this woman's great idea on how they're gonna solve it is ask her what her mom would do because obviously, if I don't know a plan and someone goes, hey, why don't you just pretend you're someone far more intelligent than yourself? That just makes me solve everything immediately. That's how that works. I mean, even even she knows how stupid that is. She's like, yeah, well, she would just know the answer. Oh, you're a smart one. And then she says, okay, then what would Ben do? And little bit pop it over here says, well, he would just grab a pen, do the maths and start mansplaining. And I'm like, hang on, hang on, hang on. So you don't know the answer. 
Ben would know the answer, and you're going to call that mansplaining. I mean, I mean, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know the exact definition of your just completely made up fantasy language, but I'm pretty sure if you don't know the answer and someone is telling you the answer, that's just called explaining or teaching or educating or just being smarter than you are, you dumb little... But no, 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 no. We're definitely going to get mansplaining in there like it's an actual word and not one which is completely used by total degenerates. So after all this, what's her plan? Well, her plan is to do what Ben does, which seems to be grab a pen and paper, do some maths, and then mansplain it to everyone. Right. And after all of this uproar, do you want to know what her plan was? To stop the train and then put it in reverse. Oh, five head. I don't know how I could have possibly have thought of that one. I would have needed a man to mansplain that to me myself. It's kind of blowing my mind that apparently if we have one line of track and we drive away from where we need to go, then at some point we need to stop and reverse. <gasps> Oh, genius, genius. I don't know why I didn't see it myself. I guess that's why she's paid the big bucks. But then woman in a dress hits the mainstay and she's got an interesting way of dealing with the brakeman. Yeah, I'm gonna kick this lid in your face. Admittedly, I think that'd probably hurt. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is going to hurt. It definitely looks like it hurts. Yeah, that's definitely gonna hurt. <laughs> I wanna be in the director's meeting for that. I just wanna hear everybody's like, well, how, what do you want me to do? Okay. Bear with me. I want you to slam your face into this metal floor. Have you got that? <laughs> yes, it's like, yes, I am a classically trained Shakespearean actor. And with that, I could smash my face into a metal floor greater than any person before. So we've worked out there's a three minute window in order to reverse. But we've just realized something's gone horribly wrong, even though there was a big slam behind us a little bit before and we didn't pay any attention to it. She's like, I told you to lock you in the meat locker, but they thought the library would be more secure. Yes, because if I ever need to lock up some kind of master criminal, uh, I, my first thought is the library. Why do you have a prison cell in the library in the first place? How important are those books? I do like that the guy she brought with her, uh, his only use is to stand on the floor. Oh, what a champion. At this point, everyone's like, what on earth is she about to grab out of there? Don't worry, it's just a cigarette. I think that's probably the least most exciting thing ever to come out of someone's top. But she is extremely happy with it. Way more happy than anyone else has been in the entire world to reach into their own top. Have to admit, lighting a cigarette with a cattle prod is pretty cool. Although we do get the marvelous line from her. Let's talk about going home to daddy. I don't know whether she means the little girls or her daddy, but either way, it's probably daddy to both of them at this point. This was an interesting screen to pause on. So little Brakeman has slowly woken up with ringing in her ears. She's realized that she can't get up because the guy is standing on the floor. But there's a rather obvious weakness to their plan, and I don't know why no one else has thought of it yet. And it's that. Like, seriously, if I was going to lock someone underground on the bottom of a train, one of the first things that I would be worried about is, is there another exit to that tunnel I've just locked them in? And the answer is yes. So why did nobody think of that? <laughs> Okay, so they send that guy up back through the roof, even though they've taken all of the original guy's energy, even though he didn't need to get all of the original guy's energy because there's a woman up there with lots more energy. She's still upset that she can't get through the ceiling, even though there's a tunnel right next to her, which she's really slow in realizing is actually there. It's amazing it took her this long to realize just go down the tunnel, it'll be fine. I'm also not sure we really have to enact this kind of die-hard scene. So the guy's on the top, and the energy situation goes from stupid to moronic and worse very, very quickly. Because that guy, even though he knows he's only got eight minutes left, and it's probably less now because that was before they sent the guy up, says, just throw me the rope, and then you take him back. Even though she's got the energy that he needs to survive, and so if she leaves, he's dead. There is no ifs, ors, or buts here. And he's like, well, he's fading, Josie. I'll catch up. It's like, no, you'll be dead, is what you'll be. So she might as well not even bother throwing you the rope. I don't know why you care. The easy way for you to survive this is just for you to go up there. Even if she's back with that guy earlier until the train arrives, no one's going anywhere. So it's not as if anyone gets back any sooner. None of this makes any sense. She asks, what's his suit at? He says 20. It's probably more like six or less at this point. I... Bewildering. Bewildering is the only word. I don't know why he's saying this. All he has to go is seven foot up in the air and then he won't have to die. But instead, he's deciding not to bother and tell her. We're talking about 
maybe 30 seconds to climb the seven feet. But oh no, if you don't go an extra five feet before I do, then he'll die. So I must sacrifice myself for him. It's so arbitrary. So he gets the rope, but he sees a glowing red light. And because he sees a glowing red light, he decides not to go up to freedom and even maybe a chance at survival. No, the glowing red light comes first. At this point, I can only assume he's some kind of moth because he can't walk away from a light. Seven minutes 20, it said eight minutes before. So it took them 40 seconds to get that guy up there and then the rope back down. So we, we are talking, he is going to die because he didn't want to waste 30 seconds getting up there himself. I've never seen anyone throw their life away so easily. But either way, she sets back off to the train, even though the train isn't back yet. And he decides to go for a wonder because he's got seven minutes left anyway. He knows he's going to die. Might as well go and look at this shiny LED for a bit. I don't know what his plan is. We are now just looking through a window at a glowing LED. Look, I do get it. It means there's power in this building, which is weird because it's been a few years. But... You do have a train with a perpetual motion machine, so it's not unlikely that there are other engines in the world that physically exist. But he goes further into the base, hunting down the glowing LED because he wants to stare at it. I don't know what he's thinking, but instead what he finds is this. It's a machine which glows. It's a lot of use. I mean, this guy isn't an engineer. He has no idea what this is or what it can do. But he really thought he needed to go and look at this LED. But then he hears a noise behind him. And this is where the television show gets really stupid. I mean, he does find that on a wall, though. And personally, if I see that on a wall, I'm probably leaving. In fact, no, I'm not probably leaving. I am leaving. I, I, I don't want to go into buildings where I see that on a wall and then stay in them. It's never a good sign. And he's still hearing doors banging and other noise. And the apocalypse has happened. And no one else is alive on the face of the planet. Personally, I'd be off. He decides to say hello. You know, hello. As you do to ghosts, burglars, potential attackers in the dark. Yeah, just, just say hello. That, 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 it always goes well. It's like he's never seen a movie in his life. He's now got four minutes 30 left to live. And he's still... Going after a banging door and an LED. So with four minutes 30 left to live, he goes deeper into the base. It sounds like a great idea. If he just goes to the surface, that woman will be able to give him power and everyone can survive. We're going deeper into the base. He finds an open door, says hello to it, and then walks in. It's like he's never seen a horror film before. But he finds someone's, like, home base with lots of the glowing sort of little golden metallic sheets that people use for temperature. Like, oh, I'm really cold. I'm going to wrap myself in this incredibly thin piece of tin foil. It's at this point he realizes there's someone alive. And there are so many problems with that. I don't know where to begin. And that torch isn't his. So they dive in and start hitting him with a stick, as you do, you know. You're the last person alive on the face of the earth. You've just found somebody else when you think everybody else is dead on the entire face of the earth. And your first instinct is to hit them with a stick. I tell you, your mum never taught you any manners, did she? So they're just starving a fight in their suits, which are running out of oxygen. Well, at least is is. So he gets hit with this stick and the screen goes black. It's not a good sign. So she's going back to the train and she has no idea what's happened. And you can't really expect her to because she was lied to for absolutely no reason. They're still fighting with the stick. It's not the best fight scene I've ever seen in my life, mainly because they're both in big bulky suits, which means they're all big, slow and clunky. It's a bit like in that Bond film where they decided they were going to fight underwater and and so you end up with about half an hour of really boring action because it's underwater, which means everything is really slow and dull. That's what you've got here. Would have been better if he'd come down, found some kind of warm environment and taken his suit off so they could have a proper fight. But apparently, no, we've got to do it in the suits. Either way, he wins, even though he got repeatedly hit with a stick. Luckily, in the acting profession, the stick's probably made of rubber, so it didn't hurt him that much. Although he has run out of time means he's dead congratulations i don't know what your plan was but it succeeded and his suit is now minus 14 degrees i do like the fact that as long as his suit has power 
it's 14 degrees. The, the instant it hits zero, it immediately goes to minus 14. Nothing in the middle? No. I, I would love to know the power of the heating element in that suit because it's got to be strong. So she's doing her little mind games and trying to get into the driver's head. Your mother's dead. Uh, model's all wrong. Uh, there is no sort of magic savior ground that you can go off to where we can all live in peace and harmony and dance with the penguins. You probably just go back to Wilford like I want to. It's not one of my most convincing arguments, but it's weird because it seems to get inside her head anyway. It's probably in the script. And her only rebuttal isn't anything about the morality of the situation. It's just, well, you don't know what data we've discovered. Oh, congratulations. You think it's a mile a minute, you do. I'm really getting diehard vibes from this. I, I would love to know why there's a tunnel that goes from the floor into the ceiling, but... You know, I, I mean, the train was only designed by a genius. Who am I to argue? I was hoping she'd like flip over. So she'd like come down head first and then flip over in the middle. But apparently the stunt woman couldn't do that. She's like, Wilford has the answer. Just keep going. Just keep going. There were other scenes in season two where she got into someone's head so much more eloquently than this. This is just tell her to keep going. It'll all be good. Oh, okay. And then she says it again, just keep going because she's, she's, it's a master plan. I don't think this part of the script took too long to make, but she is pissed and she finds a wrench. I think she's going to have some fun. So she walks up, hits Tweedledee in the face. He goes down immediately, <laughs> goes to threaten the second one who screams no, holds up the taser and immediately drops it. <laughs> You know, she wasn't the hardest villain to defeat. In fact, defeating her basically involved walking up to her and then she just kind of surrendered. Like, she knows her weaknesses and it's basically everything except talking to people and Wilford. So, uh, no wonder she wanted to get back to him. She played a far darker character in the second series and altogether, it does seem without him as a sort of um, muscle, she doesn't kind of really carry any of the same weight or at least she shouldn't do. Because now she's saying she could go back. We need to just go put it in reverse and we need to go and save them because if we don't go back, three people are dead. Three of our friends are dead. But then the other woman is going, no, we should just go forwards. So I like, just think about it. Who has the better argument? We need to go back and save three of our friends or we should go back to the guy that you despise who raised you from a kid and you've hated him the entire time. I don't know. It seems like a really challenging and difficult thing to choose between. And instead of just deciding, she starts screaming at them to stop as if there was any kind of controversial or difficult choice to be made. Oh, I can't choose whether I should go back to the guy that I despise or save my friends. I don't know. I don't know. What, what do you want? What do you want? Do you want to win a million dollars or jump off a bridge? Oh, it's a tough choice. But in probably the most based part of the entire episode, uh, she decides to take it into her own hands and just starts accelerating. I mean, I'm not sure what her plan is at this point. Obviously, they're going to stop her in about two seconds as they do with a wrench to the back of the face. So now both evil people have been hit in the face with a wrench. It's, it's a good day. It's been a good day. For some reason, though, she doesn't slow down. And I still don't know why. She's still not slowed down. The brakeman is now telling her to stop the train, even though the brakeman knows how to stop the train. You just pull the deaccelerator lever and everything's fine, except she decided to go on the opposite side of her, away from the lever, and tell her to do it, as she doesn't do it just because she was told not to. I... I, I, I I don't know why. I don't know why. At least in the other things, they were like, there was a reason why people listened to her. There was a reason why it got through to them. And in this, none of it makes sense. And she's like, what if she's right? What if Wilfred is the best best? I'm like, you do really realize he'll still exist, right? You can go and save your friends and then drive back to Wilfred if you really want. You can. You can do that. This isn't even a choice, dear. And then she's like, no, he's not the way Melanie is. I'm like, well, Melanie's dead. So, you know, you're stuffed if that's your answer. But we stop the train and put it in reverse. Like we should have done a long time ago. So Leighton wakes up, even though he passed out and it hasn't gotten any warmer. And luckily realizes that he passes out next to something that can give him power for his suit. The coincidences are starting to stack up pretty steeply at this point. But he plugs himself in and he's fine. He'll start start getting energy, he won't be minus 14 anymore, and he'd be able to survive. He knew none of this when he decided to go out and look at the blinking light. Now, it does at this point say that his suit is minus 38. I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure he already would be dead. <laughs> and this is the bit I despise. He starts to hallucinate everybody. Yes, 
we're into vision territory and i love nothing more in a tv series which is supposed to have some kind of grounding in science to have hallucinations and visions because he's looking around there's no snow this is a habitable place their paradise and then he sees it the tree from the intro sequence and that means it's important that means is integral to the plot that means this isn't just a hallucination it's probably far 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 more important and in the intro sequence the train came from this if they make this anything to do with the creation of the train i'm gonna scream at them or something i don't know i haven't thought that far ahead it also means that it's very unlikely that this is just a random hallucination and it is more like a vision which will turn out to be true even though we have no magical visions or any kind of magic in the show but now we do, now we've got visions of the future. I didn't like it when Battlestar Galactica started introducing magic into their show, and I don't like it here. I don't mind you putting magic in your show, as long as you make it part of your universe early on. But when we're three seasons in, and now you start doing it, uh, now I have a problem with this. And he comes back from being cold, because he's warmed up, and he realizes he's had a vision. He probably thinks he's hallucinated at this point, but we've got all the evidence to know he, he hasn't. But the cold woman's back by the line, and the train isn't there. Which is one of the reasons giving the other guy all of his energy wasn't a good idea now she's realized that Leighton isn't coming back i don't know what she thinks would be the reason for this because there is no reasonable explanation why he wouldn't have followed her and would have just given the guy all of his energy and then not got up because none of it makes sense but the train comes back and they start getting the two of them back on board and she's like i've got to go back with him and he's like josie his suit ran out of power five minutes ago. Like, you could have told her that before. I mean, she could have actually probably saved him if she'd gone back and hooked her power to his. Like, should have happened before. But apparently this guy, you just counted down the guy's power and went, Ah, he's dead now. I'm not telling anyone. <laughs> I'm going to wait until they get back to break the news that I knew he was going to die all along. Oh, it's so nice of him. He was well worth saving, wasn't he? But don't worry, because here he is. <laughs> He also seems to be carrying the extra bloke on his shoulders, so um, you better hope that guy wanted to be saved. It seemed like he had a pretty nice life as it was, to be honest. He even has his own power source. Back to the rolling gulag, with a nice bit of classical music in the background just to add that extra creepy twinge. The dog is wagging its tail and looking at him as if, oh, I'd love to eat your neck again. And we get to see this guy's idea of staying within the rules of the game, but also being incredibly creative. You see, those people wanted to sit in a soup of their own filth. So now, he's just going to give them their own filth. They stole hot water resources, and that means they need to be punished. And he's going to make them do it. Although I do like to say, yeah, they had to be clean, so you go unwashed. He's simultaneously insulting them, saying that they all smell, and going to make them smell as well. He's not going to wash them. They get nothing out of it. They just get to make those people worse and drag them down to their level. I'm not sure he's sending the right message there. You get a bucket and you uh, put it into that very interesting colored fluid. I have a feeling that's not chocolate milk. And she's like, it's all right. It was worth it. I'm like the guy standing right there. If he thinks that this isn't a punishment, he's going to make it worse. How about you shut your tiny little mouth? Otherwise, you're probably going to lose an arm. And believe me, this is a lot better than losing an arm. <laughs> but he yeets it at them. And admittedly, even though for some reason the guy is far shorter than her, he still manages to hit them both in the chest. He was being nice. It's more than I can say for everyone else. Because the next guy comes, grabs the bucket, and yeets it straight in that guy's face. <laughs> you couldn't have got a better aim shot than that one. Fuck. <laughs> All I'm saying is I think the whole you smell because of them kind of had a better reaction than that guy was expecting. It's definitely not chocolate milk. <laughs> oh, I could watch this all day. <laughs> Anyone that likes this scene, there's a Jimmy Carr show called Distraction. It's amazing. We really needed a cut to this scene immediately afterwards, did we? On the food. Really? Really? Mmm. Mmm. Slop. I hate to miss a public defiling, but the proceedings are rather foregone, aren't they? I love Sean Bean. He's like, I'd much rather be here embarking with my friends on a fresh path. I think they're about to do something really creepy because the two doctors are doing something to the baby. And those are the two doctors which are really twisted and sick and love human experimentation. This is not going to be good. Luckily, she's unconscious and I'm not sure she knows any of this has ever happened. 
It's clearly not the first time it's happened. But Queen of the Resistance has rebuilt her map and decided to look out of the tiny window, which I can only assume was designed for some kind of dwarf. And as we go back to the fast train, we find him alive and well in his place, looking at the guy who hit him with a stick that he kidnapped and brought back to his train against his will. I'm not sure this is the story that should be that of the good guys, but this is the good guys we've got, apparently. I mean, I've already already watched this episode once, and I don't think I was paying attention to this bit because I didn't realize that she was the one they brought back. Live and learn. But then, once again, just in case it hadn't annoyed me enough the first time, he gets new flashes of the tree again, just so you all realize how important this is. I don't know whether this tree is meant to be melting the Ice Age, or this was the magic tree which brought the train about, or this is the tree he's going to be looking for in the future. But either way, I don't care, because the only reason he knows this tree existed is because he's magically seen it in a vision. If you couldn't write a decent explanation... It's like you already had an explanation on how you could have found this in the previous season. It's how you started this season. You had a model. You could have traveled the world and found it over there. But now, no, now we've got to find it because of magic. We've got to find it because of magic. I hate when you crowbar magic into a world where it didn't exist. And he's like, ah. Oh. There's a magic tree. I think we're supposed to think that's really deep, but it really wasn't. Now, one of the issues when I make this kind of review is because I go through so much of it and I try and make it as entertaining as I can, uh, it can come off like I'm criticizing it more than I actually am just because, you know, I like taking the piss out of things. Now, I like Snowpiercer. I've liked season one and I thought season two was great. I think Sean Bean is excellent. Um... And the first time when I watched this episode, I really enjoyed this one as well. There's enough of it going on, which really keeps the pace going. And while I really hope they cut out of this whole, we're going to go on a different train and we're going to go outside and start visiting places. I don't like that at all. I like the kind of Machiavellian politics of the first two seasons rather than we're going to go outside and fall through a floor. Because that's where I think the weaknesses are. So for me, the sooner the two trains link up and we can get back to that kind of uh, vying for position, the better. But I'm not sure we're going to get that anymore. Because while I enjoyed this episode, despite obviously when I watch it back, I can see plot holes and like weird story things that I didn't spot the first time. My issue is rather than having kind of causation cause plots, now we're just going into coincidence and magic to explain everything. There's a definite drop in the quality of the reasoning behind the story. A guy went out to where some kind of weather model said it was likely to have melted the snow. And as he was walking along, he happened to walk through the one bit of roof which was weak and fall in it because they walked all around it and they never fell through any more of the roof. Then when he's down there, he decides to give him all of his power and then send him up. So that guy will definitely die. Even though if he just gone to the surface with them, he could have got power off the other woman and everyone would have survived. And rather than saving himself, he decided to not have enough energy and then go into a bunker because he saw a sign of power. And then we find out after he's fallen through the only bit of roof which he could have fallen through, now we randomly find the only person left alive on all of Earth. Now, I've seen people comment before in Star Trek Discovery, there's a bit where a guy goes through a wormhole and then crashes into another ship. And the comment there was, space is so massive, the odds of you ever coming out of a wormhole in a random place and hitting something is astronomical. And I know that's not the same on Earth, but I would say if there was one other person left alive on Earth, the odds of me throwing a dart at a map and hitting exactly where they were would be astronomical. And yet that's what we had here. So you combine that are coincidence followed by coincidence followed by coincidence and then add into that magical visions and you're kind of stepping off into the deep end one bit too much for me i don't mind in a tv series suspending my disbelief and just having things happen i don't mind a lot of stuff where it's like okay that was a mega coincidence but it drives things forwards so i'll let it go but when you keep stockpiling them one on top of another to make it just so that there's a bit where i'm like that is just stupid well, now we've reached that point. And I reached that point when we're having magical visions of trees in, in, in a show essentially about intelligent engineers on a train. So at this point, I'm very cautious about season three because I really enjoyed season one and two. But what I enjoyed it for 
hasn't actually existed in this season so far. I like the backstabbing, the stories, the people vying for position and the Machiavellian nature of everything. People playing games and using other people on the trains as pawns, uh, trading favors and goods so they can get something done. Trying to one-up each other for power. But now they've separated off into two trains and we don't have that anymore. We might with the resistance, but the resistance didn't actually do anything in this episode. So again, there wasn't much to show for it. And instead, what we replaced that for was incredible coincidences and magic. So all in all, I'm not really sure. I like the episode, but this season I think is on a knife's edge and could very easily just choose to topple off into the abyss. So... I think this is going to be an interesting one to watch. Now, I have watched one and two. I will definitely be finishing the rest of this episode. And, uh, I don't know. Where the reviews go will probably depend on where the series goes. But for now, that's it from me. If you like the video, press like and subscribe. More videos like this in the future. And let me know what you thought of the review down below. But for now, that's it from me. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.